Hi, my name is Annette Bay Pimentel. I write true stories about real people for kids. I'm here in my house, and you're probably in your house too, which might be unusual because usually you're probably at school or off doing sports or other clubs. But for me, it's kind of normal life because I write my books from my house. The thing that's different for me is when I have a new book come out, then I get to go visit schools to share the book with kids. And this year, I haven't gotten to do much of that, so I'm happy I get to share it with you. But I have been able to mail out my books to some different teachers and librarians. I knew that I was going to have to mail out some books, so I bought a package of padded envelopes that I could put the book into and mail it safely. My books are all about people, so usually when the book comes, it's a nice, tall, skinny rectangle. And so I got padded envelopes that would fit books that are that shape. But when I got the book, I discovered it is not a tall, skinny rectangle at all. It is a square and it does not fit in the padded envelopes that I bought. So when I have to mail out a book, I have to get scissors and cut up one envelope and then cut up another envelope and use strapping tape to put them together. And the whole time I am grumbling thinking, what was that book designer thinking? Why did they make my book a square? I want you to think about that question and we'll stop partway through the book and talk about it. The name of this book is all the way to the top, how one girl's fight for Americans with disabilities changed everything. The words are by me, Annette Bay Pimentel. The art is by Nobby Ali. It's published by Sourcebooks. And the real life person that this book is about, Jennifer Keelan Chaffins, wrote the foreword. Jennifer Keelan may be small, but her voice is mighty. Yeehaw! Snowball responds, speeding up from a walk to a trot. Jennifer loves to go fast, but she knows she'll soon have less time for riding since she's finally old enough for school. She can't wait to make new friends. She's ready to go. The school's not far. Jennifer rolls outside down the sidewalk to the corner, but stop. A four-inch curb is a cliff to someone in a wheelchair. Her grandpa eases her wheelchair over the curb. Though the drop jolts Jennifer, she makes it to the building. But stop! The school says Jennifer doesn't belong there because she uses a wheelchair. Instead, Jennifer and her mom find a different school that says she can att can attend kindergarten but only for part of the afternoon when lunch is over. As Jennifer rolls in each day, everyone is already busy. She has to figure out what's going on and how to join in. Since most kids have never met someone who uses a wheelchair, her classmates are confused and even a little afraid. You'll never be one of us, some of them say. How would you feel if someone said that to you? Jennifer knows they're wrong. She's just a friend waiting to happen. But how do you change someone's mind? She's not sure, but she's not about to give up. Jennifer and her family hear about activists who are working to make sure people with disabilities have access to public places like schools. They want to know more, so they attend a strategy meeting. Jennifer has never seen anything like it. The room is full of grown-ups with all sorts of disabilities. Some use wheelchairs, some use canes. None of them are sitting around waiting for things to change. They're shouting, laughing, and planning a big protest to get wheelchair lifts on buses. They turn to Jennifer. Do you want to come? Yes. She wants to go. Downtown, Jennifer rolls to the microphone and tells her story. She leads the marchers through the streets, chanting, the people united will never be defeated. It feels good to speak up for what she believes in. She can't wait to do it again. 
She's raring to go. She rolls through streets in, she protests in Phoenix, rolls through streets in San Francisco, waves signs in Montreal. The demonstrations don't always change people's minds, but Jennifer is used to that. Even when her neighborhood school finally agrees she can attend, she and her classmates with disabilities aren't allowed to eat in the cafeteria with everyone else. That hurts, but she keeps going. Working with other activists revs her up, yet she can't help noticing that she and her sister are usually the only kids out there raising their voices. Still, she can't leave all the protesting to grown-ups. She knows firsthand that children with disabilities get ignored too, so she keeps speaking up. When Jennifer is eight, activists propose a new law called the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA. The law insists schools, governments, and businesses make room for all people, including those with disabilities. Jennifer feels like dancing. If it passes, it means sidewalks with curb cuts, buildings with ramps in addition to steps, and elevators with braille panels. It means Jennifer and her classmates with disabilities can finally go to the cafeteria with everyone else for lunch. Do you remember that question I asked you at the beginning? Why is this book a square? It's because every side is the same. Every side is equal. And this law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, is about having equal access for everyone, making it possible for everyone to participate in public. Jennifer and her family watch the news for updates on the ADA, but reporters never mention it. She switches off the TV in frustration, wishing she could change reporters' minds about what is worth talking about. Instead, the Keelans get their updates about the ADA when activist friends call. It's bad news. Members of Congress say the law will be too complicated, too expensive. They say it's just not worth it. Since the news station is ignoring people with disabilities, Jennifer and her friends are determined to find another way to make Congress hear their voices. It's go time. Her family buys plane tickets to Washington, D.C. As they march down Pennsylvania Avenue, Jennifer has never shouted louder. What do we want? The ADA. When do we want it? Now. Finally. They reach the steps of the U.S. Capitol, but stop. A mountain of steps blocks Jennifer and other people using wheelchairs from the building where Congress makes laws. Grown-ups slide out of their wheelchairs and start pulling themselves up the steps. They will make sure members of Congress know they are here. Jennifer's heart races. This is what she has been shouting about. I want to climb the steps, she says, but stop. The grown-ups think she is too young. You can't do it. Jennifer knows this is not just about her. It's about her friends at school who were shut out of the cafeteria at lunch. It's about millions of other kids she's never met who get stopped at every turn. Jennifer wants to speak up for all the kids with disabilities who aren't there. I need to climb the steps. She slides out of her wheelchair, scoots along the sidewalk to the bottom of the stairway and puts her hands on the first step. She hauls herself up. Tiny bits of dirt and rock dig into her skin. She drags herself up another step. The crowd roars. Reporters surround her with cameras and microphones recording her gutsy climb. I'll take all night if I have to, she vows. And she keeps heaving, hauling, dragging herself up those steps. She keeps going all the way to the top. 
Pictures of Jennifer climbing the steps flash around the world. Reporters start talking about the ADA. Members of Congress see the news, listen to the activists, and finally pass the ADA. Laws like the ADA don't change things overnight. Entrances have to be rebuilt, sidewalks redesigned, buses re-engineered. Slowest of all, minds have to change. So Jennifer will continue shouting and waving signs, organizing and explaining. She will continue fighting for what she knows is right. Jennifer has places to go and nothing will stop her now. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe to Gotham Reads for more of your favorite children's books read aloud daily.